good morning and welcome to Plymouth United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are an open and affirming congregation, a just peace church, an anti-racist church, and we strive to live that out each and every day. And we are so grateful to gather together on this morning as we worship God with one another. Beloved, if this is your first time worshiping with us at Plymouth United Church of Christ, we welcome you. And if this is your home church, we welcome you. We hope that you'll let us know that you worshiped with us this morning uh, by uh, filling in the form following the link that you'll see below in the comments. And you can tell us a little bit about yourselves and learn about our congregation and how to be involved. Well, this morning we are continuing the Be the Church series because we know that the church is not a building, it is the people, and it is our collective work of following in the ways of Jesus. And so this morning we will be looking at caring for the environment. And we're going to have the special opportunity of hearing Reverend Rich Kilmer give a testimony about his own journey of discovering and caring about our precious earth and creation. And so let us open with these words of opening prayer. Let us come together rejoicing, for nothing can separate us from the love of God not life nor death, not prejudice nor power, not our grief nor our fears, not the wrongs that we have done, nor the wrongs done against us. Love comes to us still. When nothing feels certain, this truth remains. The Spirit is our constant companion, ushering us towards life. So let every heart be lifted the kingdom of God is so, so close. Nothing can keep love from enfleshing among us. May it be so.
morning. My name is Reverend Richard Kilmer, and I'm a member of the Justice and Peace Task Force of this church. Uh, in 1992, I was the director of the Presbyterian Peacemaking Program, an office in the national headquarters of the Presbyterian Church USA. For the uh, denomination for Presbyterians, making peace with the earth was an element of the peacemaking task. We sent a staff person to Rio de Janeiro for the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, which among other issues addressed climate change. That conference emphasized the message that has become a very important personal belief for me. We care about the environment because God calls us to do so. And because if we don't, we hurt God's children, especially the most vulnerable human beings. For me as a Christian, <clears throat> that is why ending the climate crisis is so urgent. When I became the director for environmental justice for the National Council of Churches in 1996, I knew that we were going to have to address the climate crisis. We created climate projects in 18 states. And that effort was honored by President George W. Bush's EPA. I also attended four of the UN conferences on climate crisis, including the one in Paris, and was commissioned by this, con by this congregation to attend the conference in Madrid last year. When I retired in 2013, I asked the Christian Reformed Church headquartered here in Grand Rapids, where I'm living part-time, if I could help in any way. I wound up helping that denomination create the Climate Witness Project, which is now an important effort by that denomination. I'll be retiring from my work with the CRC soon, and I'm looking forward to other ways that I can help prevent the climate crisis from causing harm to my grandchildren. I was on a Zoom call about 10 days ago, as were some other members of this church, listening to a leader from Ann Arbor talk about their work to convince the city council of Ann Arbor to set a goal of being carbon neutral by 2030. That means that the city of Ann Arbor will stop emitting any greenhouse gases by 2030. The goal of the Paris Agreement is that the world will not emit any greenhouse gases after 2050. There are people in Grand Rapids who would like our city council to make a commitment like that one. Maybe Plymouth Church could advocate that the city council make that commitment. Perhaps we could have a sign that joins our wage peace sign that says Grand Rapids can be carbon neutral by 2030.
Gabe White, and I will be reading the lesson from the New Testament of Matthew. Okay. The Parable of the Mustard Seed. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone, that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Okay, next, the parable of the yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, a, is like yeast that women took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Okay, next, three parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, and then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the, that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. Yeah. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from right. Uh, and separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the furnace of fire where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, next, treasures new and old. Have you understood all of this? They answered, yes. And he who said this to them, therefore, or every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasures, what is new and what is old. And that is it. In times of illness and death, we often ask ourselves, what can we do to nurture life again? We may do this when we feel abandoned or when we feel antagonized by authorities during our suffering. And we ask ourselves, what can I do to enact care for the world? Today, we have been given five parables that are a way of thinking and giving us hope, that drive to that heart of embodying care and a love of creation and the love of one another. So what is a parable? Most often, we would say that a parable is a story and that is one way of thinking about a parable. But we often think about these parables often as moral tales, or at best, sometimes we think of them as allegories that reveal some hidden meaning. But parables come from two Greek words, para meaning beside and balian meaning to throw. A parable then is throwing one thing beside another to see what happens. These comparisons sometimes can shake us up when we read these parables and it can sometimes leave us scratching our heads and feeling confused by their meaning. We're kind of surprised by the unexpected twists. And this is what Jesus wants us to understand about the kingdom of God. I want to take a moment here to note that you've probably almost exclusively heard me use this language of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of God, a topic which we've talked a lot about and we've been hearing in our scriptures this summer. And I believe that the kingdom of God is many things, though I do not believe that the kingdom of God is a monarchy dominated by male leadership. The mysteries of God, the mysteries of God's visions for the world, I believe more closely resemble 
one's kin, one's family, a collective of folks in close and right relationship with one another. This truly resembles much more in my mind, this idea of the kingdom of God, rather than any imagery of a hierarchical empire. And I believe that the kingdom will come if we nurture it, like we would a mustard seed or yeast, for instance, in a sourdough starter. Today, the gospel reading from this lectionary text gives us five parables to put beside one another for us to better understand what God's vision and God's dreams for creation. And we're going to talk about the first two parables, the ones that uh, immediately follow the scripture that we looked at last week, the parable of the weeds. And perhaps you're familiar with these parables, parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. The mustard seed has been commoditized into little trinkets even found in Christian supply stores. Perhaps necklaces and earrings may also be in your own collection. And they're sold with little cards that often remind us that if we only have faith as small as a mustard seed, that God can help us to move mountains or it can grow so big that it can, it can truly do anything. Perhaps you've already drawn the conclusion that 2020 has taught us about how something so small, so undetectable, can spread so fast. And I'd argue that God's vision of the kingdom is certainly not about the spreading of a virus. But what is it about? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to explore this kingdom of God, God's vision, God's dreams for the realm of God. Amy Jill Levine in Short Stories of Jesus writes, according to the Jesus Seminar's website, like the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven makes light of an established symbol. Leaven was customarily regarded as a symbol for corruption and evil. Jesus here employs it in a positive sense. That makes his use of the image striking and provocative. To compare God's imperial rule to leaven is to compare it to something corrupt and unholy, just the opposite of what God's rule is supposed to be. And this reversal appears to, be un, appears to be characteristic of several of Jesus's sayings, such as the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And the fellows include the parable of leaven that almost certainly were said by Jesus. The parable of the leaven has often been presented to us in many white bread styles. It can certainly be presented in much tastier ways. I can't even imagine buying a loaf of bread now for my own house. I mean, this parable makes sense to me in ways that it never has before. I always imagined the leaven as the dry little yeast packages that my mom would buy and we would put in our refrigerator and I'd take out as we needed when I was a little kid. But I now understand the leaven or the yeast described in this passage is what we call today sourdough starter. And I've been cultivating my own natural yeast for the last four months. And here's some of it to show you. <laughs> it's easy to conclude what more important symbol do we have in our faith tradition than the multiplication of dough, or rather bread, that the feeding of the crowds and bread is the symbol of our communion table, which we'll talk more about next week. But there's so much more going on in the two parables today 
than merely a lesson about the possibility of the growth of the kingdom. The imagery of these two parables would have sounded both familiar and strange to the first century Jewish audience. And take the parable of the leaven. Women were bakers. Women were the ones responsible for taking the flour and the water into their hands and making something that nourished their families. The image of mixing yeast into the flour would certainly make sense. You need something to make the dough rise, to expand. Now, if we read the original Greek, the verb is actually not to mix. The verb is krupto, which means to hide. Why would the woman hide the yeast in the flour? Hmm. And this is a metaphor not only for women bakers, but also for those who bear children. Amy Jill Levine shares that the parable of the leaven connects to an ancient Jewish scripture in Genesis 18, that when we see the story of Abraham and Sarah, now older in age, that they receive three surprise visitors. And Abraham says that he will go and, and bring back a little bit of bread, a little bit of bread. Well, he tells Sarah to take three measures of flour and to make cakes, uga and encrispias. But this is more than just a conversation about baking. What the strangers ultimately tell Abraham and Sarah is that they will have a son. And it's interesting because the same amount of flour that we see in our parable three measures of flour, is the same amount that Sarah is told to use, three measures of flour. These early Jewish listeners would have been hearing that connection and making that to this scripture that they were familiar with. Women in antiquity who baked the bread, women's bodies were often analogized. Ovens were incubators, wombs and ovens that baked a child until they were ready. Hiding yeast su suggests the imagery of insemination. And this is common baking and childbirth metaphor for the messianic age. Yeast and baking are images that tell the hearers of the story to go forth and bring new and abundant life into the world. But did you catch again? How much flour? Three measures. Does anybody know how much three measures of flour really is? Okay, so we're gonna have an object lesson. So when I bake most weeks, I typically bake about 10 loaves of bread. And my <coughs> recipe makes two loaves of bread. It takes 200 grams of yeast of this sourdough starter when it's at its peak rise, peak performance. It takes 620 grams of water and 16 grams of salt. And to make 10 loaves, I have to repeat this recipe five times. And I typically use this five pound bag of King Arthur's flour. Yes, it's really good flour. And it takes this whole thing to make 10 loaves. This is five pounds of flour. Oh, I'm sorry, 10 pounds. This is 10 pounds of flour. So 10 pounds of flour. We need, now let's think about this. Let's compare this three measures of flour that the woman hides in the leaven. Three measures of flour is between 40 and 60 pounds of flour, which according to my recipe, again, if you needed that much, you would need about six of these bags. 
which if you use my recipe would yield between 80 and 120 loaves of bread. And can you imagine, can you imagine 120 loaves of bread? I imagine Sarah must have in that story when Abraham told her to bring a little bread, she must have thought a little bread, come on. And why on earth in our parable would the woman hide leaven in three measures of flour? Our authors explain it in this way. Given the enormous yield that would come from 40 to 60 pounds of flour, perhaps the parable speaks to the importance of extravagance and generosity. Perhaps it suggests that we adapt our lives in light of the kingdom to do something that might seem foolish or wasteful from the outside. In times of pandemic and crisis, we need to resist the temptation of scarcity thinking. This thinking tells us to pull up our drawbridges, to lock our doors, to hoard our resources. And this message of the yeast tells us to respond to times of death and crisis with extraordinary grace and care. This imagery of the yeast that has often been thought of yeast in the Bible as a corruptible substance, something that is decaying, in fact something that is decaying, something that is corruptible, that can transform ordinary flour into something that is of the kingdom, or kingdom, rather. So similarly, as we think about this parable of the mustard seed, this is also the time when we nurture seeds that will one day grow, that will one day offer shelter and protection to the most vulnerable. Robin Wall uh, Kimmerer describes uh, her gardening practice like this, that we should not only be raising our gardens, that we should be raising a ruckus, a ruckus on behalf of all that the world needs and all that we have to offer as gardeners. Living in reciprocity and mutual care and mutual aid, enacting a world where survival meets joy. There's another interesting connection to seeds. There's an episode of an excellent podcast called How to Survive the End of the World, Learning from the Apocalypse with Grace, Rigor, and Curiosity. Autumn Brown um, is interviewing Leah Penniman, and Leah is a soil steward and a food sovereignty activist, a co-founder of Soul Fire Farm. And Leah speaks of her ancestors who would braid seeds into their hair and before they, they were violently taken from their homes and their homeland and enslaved. And particularly the seeds that they were using was the pelargonium seeds. And the pelargonium seeds are used today by Leah and many others to heal the soil. Pelargonium plants participate in phytoremediation. It's plant remediation when plants fix things, accumulating lead and other heavy metals that detoxify the soil, enabling the growth and the nutrition for our food. Not knowing where they were going, her ancestors not knowing they would survive, they braided these seeds within their hair, knowing the, the value that they placed, that they felt 
able to carry and to keep these safe within their own hair. And so protecting what was valuable and without knowing if they would have a future. Practicing this fundament, fundamental belief in the possibility of life and of healing. So now is the time for care on the earth and for care for the earth. And so let us go forth and shake the world with these mustard seeds. Let us go forth to feed the yeast of the kingdom so that a better world may be leaven and a better world might grow. And today is the hour for such extraordinary grace and abundant life as foolish as others say that it is, we rise up and we speak and sing songs of resistance and of life. So plant on, feed your starters. Let's see what happens. Amen.
Beloveds, there are so many in need of our prayer. And we lift up Marge T recovering from a TIA. We pray for Marilyn S who discovered um, that her MS is back. We pray for Sam whose great aunt passed away and for Ashley and Sam's aunt and cousin who have COVID. We pray for Chuck B who was hospitalized and so we take this moment of silence as we lift up the prayers that are unspoken and those that are upon our hearts. As we take this moment of silence, let us pray. To you belong the mysteries of the universe. You who transform the smallest seeds into magnific magnificent trees. You who transform hardened hearts into loving ones. And so bless us with your life-giving spirit and shape us, Holy One, to be about the collective liberation and transformation of this world. And may we trust in your creative process. May we pause and recognize the yeast in our midst that which we might be suspicious of, that can do great things, that can do things that we sometimes think are foolish, but surprises us with the good. And so we give thanks for the beauty of the world, for the blossoming flowers and plants, the growth of children, the joys of celebrations of graduation and the marriages of receiving of new life and we also see the sorrows the continued struggle for justice and so god prepare us prepare us to be transformers of peace and to bring about your peace and your hope amen say that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom is like the smallest offering where our gifts are nurtured in community. We know that they will grow and they will multiply and they will blossom into sites of divine hospitality. And so with joy, we bring what we have together, trusting that it is enough. And so 
we just continue to thank you for your faithfulness as you bring forth your gifts as Plymouth continues to live out the mission of our church and the big and the small ways. And so we give thanks for your continued faithfulness. You can always give on our website and we continue to welcome your uh, checks through the mail. And so let us close with this closing benediction. Beloveds, we were made to live out the dreams of God, each of us together, through our choices and our hopes, through our community. God has given us the capacity to embody divine hospitality, to practice radical love, to be brave together, to take risks together, to do things differently. And so let us, let us depart from this time of worship with willing hearts and praying that the kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen.